Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about experimental design. Um, experiments are really important uh, type of uh, uh, study design, mostly because, you know, some researchers want to make a conclusion that infers some type of causation between two variables. You know, it might sound like X causes changes in Y. And so what we'll do in this section is describe sort of what elements are in an experiment and what actually makes an ex a study and experiment. So we'll kind of target those main characteristics. The other thing that we will do is explain what randomization means in an experiment and why randomization allows us to infer causation. Randomization is really important um, and it's really at the foundation of a lot of what we do in statistics. And so um, I'll try and make sure to emphasize why randomization actually allows us to make that causal conclusion that we're wanting to. The other thing I'll do is explain the importance of some of these other components and experiments. Now, this is going to be, I don't know, I'm going to guess a 20 minute video on experimental design. This subject goes so deep and so far that this is really just scratching the surface. So I'll be able to highlight some of the major points, but just understand that Experiments can be very complicated, very detailed, and the more uh, sophisticated the design, the more sophisticated the analysis is going to have to be. The other thing we'll do is recognize and apply appropriate experimental designs for given scenarios. You know, sometimes we might not be able to actually conduct a completely randomized experiment, and instead we might have to incorporate some other elements like blocking. Finally, we'll explain the importance of identifying what a placebo is, when it's needed, when blinding is needed uh, in experiments on humans in those clinical trials. All right, well, first we need to establish major differences between experiments and observational studies. So in an experiment, each case or each individual is randomly assigned to one of the categories of the explanatory variable. Now in experiments, this explanatory variable, we usually call that, um, you know, a factor. Uh, the factor has treatments or levels. Um, so some of these words change a little bit because we're in an experimental design, but essentially a factor is something that I believe is going to cause changes in my response variable. So um, when I have this factor, it has some levels to it maybe. Um, I could be considering three different levels of water and I'm trying to see the effects of plant growth, um, the effects it has on plant growth. And so I can have, you know, one ounce of water a day, five ounces and 15 ounces. Um, you know, that would have three different levels. And so what I would do is assign my plants randomly to either receive one ounce of water, five ounces of water, or 15 ounces, whatever I decide are meaningful um, amounts of water for my study. And so the important piece here is that each case is randomly assigned to receive one of these treatments. The difference between the observational study and an experiment is that in observational study, you know, a case sort of decides what group they're in, right? They are not assigned to be part of some group or assigned to some treatment. Um, instead, they sort of naturally fall into one of those categories. You know, if I was to determine if an apple a day really does keep the doctor away, in an experiment, I would have to randomly assign some people to eat apples and some people not to, and then maybe record how many doctor visits they have in the next year. Whereas in an observational study, you know, I would have to essentially determine are some of these people eating an apple a day, right? They decided to either be an apple a day eating person. Uh, that sounded funny. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> you know, eat an apple a day or not. Now, the advantage of an experiment over an observational study is that if an experiment's really well designed, I can infer causation. Now, I still have to keep track of things like confounding variables, making sure that I treat all of the individuals uh, in my experiment the same, with, except for the treatment that's being applied. So there's other things that go into it, but as long as the experiment's really well designed, I might be able to actually make that causal conclusion that I want to. All right, so here's an example of a completely randomized experiment. 
So that bolded term right there just means that individuals are randomly assigned to different experimental groups. Um, now those individuals, I've said the word case or individual before, in an experiment we would call them experimental units. So each experimental unit is assigned to different experimental groups. All right, so here's an example. Does classical music help with concentration? All right, so to study the effects of classical music on concentration, 26 math majors were assigned at random to two different groups. Subjects in one group listened to classical music while trying to solve a hard Sudoku puzzle, while subjects in the other group were in a silent room and the time it took them to finish uh, the puzzle was recorded. Okay, so here is our setup. And what makes this, again, a completely randomized design is the fact that 26 majors, math majors, or 26, you know, humans were randomly assigned to either be in a room with music or a room without. All right, so based on your reading, uh, we have to identify some of these different elements. What I would encourage you to do right now is go ahead and pause the video answer these on your own and come back once you've gotten your thoughts down and then you'll be able to hear what I have to say about it. All right, do you have your answers? All right, so the first one, we need to identify each of the elements. Um, the question is, what is the response variable? So what I wanted to do is remind you what a response variable was and it's a characteristic that we measure on each case. I could have also said, in this case, in each experimental unit. And so the thing that we're measuring, the thing that I'm really wanting to compare between my experimental groups, well, that would be the time it took the students to finish the Sudoku puzzle. The next thing that we need to identify is what was the treatment in the experiment? A treatment is a specific experimental condition that is being applied. Uh, this usually, corresponds to the categories of the explanatory variable. Now, sometimes a treatment, really it could be nothing at all, right? So what's being applied, the thing we believe might be changing the response, it's whether these students are listening to classical music or listening to nothing at all. So the treatment would be the room type, either a room that has classical music in it or a room that has uh, is completely silent. Each of those would be considered a treatment. In this case, what are the experimental units? And as a definition, a experimental unit is just an individual or object that receives the treatment. So what is the thing that's receiving this treatment? Well, these math majors are having to listen to either silence or the music. So the subjects are the 26 math majors. Notice I used another word there, um, subjects. Humans don't like to be called experimental units, right? We're not experimental units. So usually if an experiment is done on humans, the word subjects or even, um, or even participants, uh, those two terms are often used to refer to um, experimental units. All right, another idea here is replication. Replication is really important because I want to validate my results. I want to make sure that what I'm seeing isn't just happening by chance. So we need to make sure that we have more than one experimental unit in each of the treatment groups. So is there replication? Yes, there is. Because I have 13 math majors listening to classical music in a room, and I have 13 math majors that are listening to nothing. So there is some replication because I didn't just have one student in one room, one student in another. Now the term replication can actually take on another meaning. Um, it's re repeating the experiment completely in a different time, a different location, you know, repeating the experiment all over again. In this course, what we'll do is use the term replication to just refer to the fact we've got more than one experimental unit in each of the treatment groups. All right, so sometimes, you know, the most simple experiment really is the best. Uh, occasionally, we can't really rely on that type of design because it's not fitting. 
it's not always reasonable to do a completely randomized design because there might be some limitations, some things that I have to sort of work around. So here are a couple of other designs that you might be able to use in a given situation. One is called a block design. So in a completely randomized, um, oh, I'm sorry, a completely randomized design is being performed within each block. Now, a block is just a group of similar experimental units. And so the blocks are formed based on some unavoidable source of variation. What that means is that there's something that I need to be able to control for, and I can't get rid of it, so I block based on that characteristic. All right, let's suppose that I have a huge plot of land and there's a river flowing on the on one side of the, the land. Well, my goal is to see how fertilizer affects plant growth um, or plant production. Um, but I know that fertilizer might react differently um, near the land that's next to the river, right? Because the river has more nutrients. It's got more natural moisture. There might be different bugs over there by the river. So what I could do is block based on the proximity to the river. So I could have kind of a, let's see, I'm gonna start drawing pictures here. So let's say that I've got some land. Here is the river and I have already decided that we're going to have these plots kind of gridded out. Well, one block could be these four plots that are closest to the river. So we'll call this block one. And then within this block, I'm doing a completely randomized design. So I've randomly selected this plot to receive fertilizer. This one does not, this one and no. Now the plots that are kind of in this next row, that would be my second block. And within this block, I'm doing a, again, a completely randomized design. So no, yes, yes, no. I did that very randomly, trust me. <laughs> So anyway, this is one type of blocking because I'm able to not only measure the differences between the plots that got fertilizer and the ones that did not, I can also see if the river has any effect. In other words, I can compare what I see in block one to block two and so on. So block design is really helpful for that reason. Now a matched pairs design, we're talking about it here in experiments, but a match pairs can, design could really even be an observational study as well. So in a matched pairs design, what happens is a randomized block, it is a randomized block experiment, um, but each block consists of a matching pair of similar units. So sometimes you see these types of studies um, either in an experimental design or an observational design. And if it's an experiment, chance or, you know, randomly assigning one of these individuals to receive a treatment, one of these individuals not to, that's usually where um, the experiment part comes in. So two ways that we can have a matched pairs design. Either two separate individuals are matched on numerous characteristics, so two humans come in for some type of clinical trial, and these two individuals are the same height, same weight, same sex, same severity of disease, same everything. All right, so one might randomly be selected to receive the treatment, the other then is assigned to um, be the control. And uh, sometimes this is helpful, um, identical twin studies, you know, one twin gets a treatment, one twin doesn't, um, those are also considered matched pairs because each set of individual or each uh, pair, they are going to, we're going to look at the difference between them. And so our data then becomes all of these differences, not necessarily a whole group of uh, individuals receiving one treatment and a whole group of individuals receiving another and I just compare the means of the groups. No, if I've done this matching, I really wanna make sure that I'm keeping track of all these differences. Another way <clears throat> that we can have a matched pairs design is each individual acts as his or her own control. What that means is that, you know, an individual might have a pre-measurement and a post-measurement. Think of weight loss. 
you know, everybody goes into some weight loss program at a given weight. The interest is in how much weight has been lost. So the difference between the ending weight and the beginning weight, that would be a match pairs design. Another example of a match pairs design is, is something that looks, you know, looks like this. Researchers studied the effects of two different breathing frequencies on performance times for 10 male college, uh, uh, college swimmers. Each swimmer ran the same, they didn't run, swimmers swim, right? Swam the same stroke 200 meters using one breathing technique and again using the other the order of the breathing technique was, was randomly assigned. So in this situation, we have 10 swimmers. Each of the 10 swimmers is um, acting like their own block, right? Because each swimmer is going to have two different measurements on them. Breathing te technique number one and breathing technique number two. So even though this has its own name, matched pairs experiment, we really can consider it a a specific type of blocking design. So you can see here that the blocks are each pair of measurements. This is really a swimmer, right? 10 swimmers. And then for each swimmer, we have the random assignment of either doing uh, breathing technique number one or number two. In this case, the second swimmer did number two and then number one. But when it comes down to analyzing the data, what I'm going to be considering is the difference in these two times. So the difference, the difference, and then we'll be looking at that maybe in a graph or some summary statistics. All right, let's design a study. So what I want you to do is take a moment to think of how you might actually design some study. All right, the goal here would be to design a study to collect data so that we can answer this following question. Is the average time to complete a Sudoku puzzle different between four types of Sudoku puzzles? Numbers, letters, Greek letters, or symbols? Now, a Sudoku puzzle requires you in a nine by nine grid to have, for example, numbers one through nine appear only once in each row and each column. So it definitely takes some time to, you know, organize all of these numbers or letters or symbols. And so let's suppose you're part of a team that's going to design a study to investigate this research question. Suppose the popula population of interest is all adults and we have a sample of adults to participate in the study. So the things that I want you to think about would be what is the response variable? Is it categorical or quantitative? What is the explanatory variable? And then what type of study are you going to be designing, right? Experimental or observational? So take some time to jot down your thoughts. Um, write down what your design might be, um, you know, uh, how you might implement it, things that you might want to look out for. All right, did you have a second to think about uh, your design? All right, well, with that in mind, I wanna ask you, um, what kind of confounding variables would you be concerned about when designing this study? Now, um, even though you're designing an experiment, there's you know always the chance that there's the, a confounding variable that could really influence the results. So always take some time to think about it. Now, when um, I think about this, one you know, major thing that comes to mind is experience. I think that people who um, are really good at doing Sudoku puzzles, they could probably be successful in any one of those groups, um, doing a puzzle in numbers, letters, you know, or even Greek letters. So the one thing we want to make sure is that we have sort of an even mix of experience in all of the groups that we assign a puzzle to. One great thing about experimental, I'm sorry, uh, randomization is that when I randomly assign all of these subjects to four different groups in which, you know, each group is going to get a puzzle, I would hope that through random assignment, each group is going to have some experienced puzzle, um, uh, some experienced people who have done these puzzles, as well as some inexperienced ones. And so I can really account uh, I can count on the fact that this is going to be the case because I'll use random assignment to split up all of the subjects into these four different treatment groups. Another thing that we would want to try and control for or account for is lo location or environment. 
because if a uh, one group is doing this in a really noisy setting, whereas another group's doing it in a very quiet setting, that really could influence the results. So when I'm designing an experiment, you know, randomization might take care of things like experience. So in other words, I have four different groups that have, you know, an even mix of experienced and inexperienced um people, I want to make sure that the environment is all the same for all of the groups. So if I decide on a quiet environment, that needs to be applied to all of the different treatment groups, keeping that control. The other thing that might have an influence is time of day. Uh, if we're doing these puzzles really early in the morning, people not, might not be able to think quite as clearly as maybe, you know, a little bit later or even at um, late afternoon. So I need to make sure that I do control for this and I give these puzzles at the same time of day for all of these different treatment groups. So just because we've done an experiment doesn't mean that I have to not worry about all of these other confounding variables because really, you know, these could be influencing my results. All right, here's an example of uh, another clinical trial. This is an experiment done on humans. And in this example, uh, investigators were looking at different treatments for Parkinson's disease. One was uh, Parkinson's, um, Parkinson's patients being treated with a injection into the brain of some fetal tissue uh, in the hope that this injection would replace some of the damaged brain cells. In a clinical trial set up to determine the effectiveness of this treatment, 40 patients with Parkinson's disease, half received the treatment while the other half did not. Each patient was randomly assigned to receive a new treatment or to receive nothing at all. So that's the setup to try and look to see if this um, treatment is actually effective in reducing the symptoms of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. One thing we need to really identify in any scenario that you come across is what is the treatment? Um, we need to identify these elements of the experiment. So the treatment in this study, well, let's think about what was actually being applied to each experimental unit. We could have called these subjects. The treatment was fetal tissue being injected into the brain. And in this case, the experimental unit would be the patients with the Parkinson's disease. What type of design did the researchers use? Well, I go back to the initial setup, and it looks like we had 40 Parkinson's patients. Half were randomly assigned to receive the treatment. The other half um, received nothing at all. So in this case, it sounds like a pretty classic, completely randomized design. Now... One thing to consider, especially because we're dealing with humans here, is that those assigned to the control group, um, they didn't receive anything at all. Now, suppose that those in the treatment group, the ones that actually got the injection, they started feeling more positive, healthier. Man, they really feel like this treatment worked. Would you be willing to conclude that the response could be attributed only to that treatment? So in other words, is the way this experiment set up, does it lead us to say, yeah, this treatment must be working? Mm, I don't know about that. All right. Just knowing that you're getting a treatment might make you feel better, right? So based on the way that this experiment was set up, I I'm, would be cautious if people in the treatment group were remarkably feeling better or feeling remarkably better. Well, just knowing that they're getting a treatment can make them feel better. This is actually known as the placebo effect. Now, the placebo effect is um, something that we can't get rid of, right? We can't eliminate it, but we can control for it or account for it. The way that we account for the placebo effect is to give the control group a placebo. This is a treatment that is exactly like the active treatment, but does not contain any active ingredient. Now, depending on the situation, um, like our Parkinson's disease patients who did not receive anything at all, um, a treatment would actually look like giving them an injection so that when they're coming out of 
you know, surgery, it looks like they've gotten an injection. They feel like they've gotten an injection, but that injection wouldn't have any active ingredient in it. Now, this might not be ethical, and there's lots of things that kind of go into a study like this. Um, and there are ways of, you know, um, designing studies so that you can, as best you can, control for the placebo effect. All right, won't get into that too much, um, but one thing that we do need to recognize is that when a control group is given a placebo, that is called a blinded study. That's because the control group, those individuals, they've agreed to participate, but they don't know really what group they're in. They don't know if they're getting the active ingredient or not. Sometimes it's worth, it's uh, required that we do a double blinded study. A double blinded study happens when neither the person who could influence the results, in other words, the patients, or the person evaluating the results, think of the doctor or the researcher, both of those individuals have no clue what subject, um, what group the subjects belong to. Um, you know, it could be that the information is in an envelope that nobody looks at, or some third party is keeping track of what participants are in each of these groups. But when it comes to actually delivering the treatment and evaluating, nobody really knows if the, each individual is getting the real treatment or not. So once the study is over, that's when all the information comes out. And then, you know, um, researchers can look at any significant differences in the um, symptoms of the two patients or two groups. All right, so let's talk a little bit about ethics and experiments. Now, again, I'm just scratching the surface on this kinds of um, this kind of subject. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. So hopefully this kind of gets you thinking in that direction. So um, we explained kind of why it was important for a control group sometimes to receive a placebo, right? It's important because we need to be able to account for the placebo effect. Now, if I know my group that is receiving a placebo let's say feels 10% better. Well, I can imagine that's due to the placebo effect. And so I know then that there's probably about a 10% placebo effect in my treatment group. But if my treatment group, you know, feels 50% better, well, then I know that that 40% difference must be because of the actual treatment that's being applied. All right, so is it ethical to perform what is called a sham surgery on that control group? Now, you'd think, oh, gosh, no, actually giving somebody an injection, that's not going to help them. That's not ethical at all. Well, in very rare instances, it actually can be done. You know, you got to jump through a bunch of hoops, lots of paperwork, I guarantee it. Um, but essentially what a researcher would have to do is... Um, Men or he would have to make the claim that there is absolutely no other way to measure the placebo effect. The other thing is that uh, patients would have to be given consent. They'd have to know exactly all of the risks that they are uh, signing up for. And often researchers have to give them equitable uh, treatment after the study is over. So in very, very rare situations, these, you know, sham surgeries, these like placebo type surgeries can be done, um, but it's not very common at all. Periodically during a clinical trial, um, statisticians will do an analysis of the data up to a certain point to kind of determine how the treatment is working. So essentially they'll kind of, you know, look in and see how things are going. Now, if the statistician det determines that there is already a significant difference in the response between the treatment and control group, is it ethical to withhold this information from those in the study and essentially letting the study go on and on for the rest of the 10 years? Now, I would say no. If I was involved in a study that was lasting years and years and years, and, you know, maybe the study um, was either, you know, there was a control group involved maybe even sham surgeries involved, whatever that might be, you know, if I can already tell that there's going to be a significant difference and we've got data to prove it after two years, I couldn't ethically let that study go on because that means that there's another five to 10 years worth of sham surgeries that don't need to be performed, right? We've already got our significant data. 
So when um, a statistician does this properly and kind of looks into the data um, before the end of the study and sees, gosh, we've got what we need, really the study should be ended there. And then the last kind of topic is volunteers are almost always used for clinical trials. Now, in a couple lessons ago, we talked about how volunteers sometimes are biased, uh, results in a biased sample. And that is certainly the case that happens sometimes. Right? Cases can only um, really um, volunteer for these clinical trials, uh, but they have to meet certain like conditions or the certain um, criteria. So even though these are volunteers, you know, researchers might say that they have to be a certain stage of disease, certain age, certain height, weight, all of these characteristics. And so with this in mind, we might be able to actually make a conclusion to a larger population based on the results of these clinical trials, because from the pool of volunteers, researchers have really selected a certain um, group of individuals that meet given criteria, right? So they've essentially been able to pick what they believe to be a representative sample. So the hope is that if they find significant results in their sample, um, then they say, you know, for these reasons, this sample represents some larger population, but it really is more based on how well they have modeled the population, um, and it's not based on any type of random selection. So in other words, they've got to make a really good argument that they've got good representative data, but they still sometimes can make a pretty meaningful conclusion. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for listening. This was all about experiments. And uh, next, we're going to be talking about how to actually analyze the data or summarize the data um, that we've collected based off of these study designs. <laughs>